everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus a little bit of insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And we're back from Comic-Con, and none of us appear to be deathly sick. <laughs> this is incredible. Just a matter of time. Also, here is Dennis Zen. <laughs> Not deathly sick, but I am pretty exhausted. But yes, I still have up. the Comic-Con buzz, the after buzz going, and I'm excited to talk about all the stuff we saw. Also, here's Mark Ellis. It was great meeting all the Collider fans at the Masters of the Web panel that yes, we did, yeah. and just walking around the four. You guys are the best in the world. If I got the flu from one of you, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, the nerd flu has not yet taken root, I, so I, but I think we all pretty much survived okay. Yeah, big shout out and thank you to all of you guys who came first of all out to the masters of the web panel and then even though we it was very last second put together all of you came out to the meet and greet to the movie talk mm -hmm. meet and greet it was great meeting all you guys all of you who stopped us at comic con it was just you guys made it such a fun time to be at incredibly busy we're all exhausted and we're going to talk a lot of comic con today but before we do we got some other stuff to deal with. So, Ashley, what's up? Well, it's Monday, so that means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Coming in at the number one spot by a massive landslide is the first standalone film for Despicable Me's Minions. Minions took in over $115 million this weekend, making it the second biggest opening for an animated film of all time, ahead of Toy Story 3 and just behind Shrek the Third, which opened with $121 million in 2007. Coming in at the number two spot is Jurassic World, making an additional $18 million in its fifth week. In at the number three spot is Pixar's Inside Out, making an additional $17 million. In fourth, it's Terminator Genesis, bringing in $13.7 million for a two-week domestic total of $68.7 million. And rounding out the top five is the new horror film, The Gallows, bringing in just over $10 million. John, what stands out to you in this week's box office report? Well, uh, congrats to Minions. It just destroyed everything in its path, which I, I don't think comes as a surprise to any of us. I think we we thought it was going to come in a little over 100 million. I predicted originally that it would probably be one of the billion dollar film clubs. I'm not so sure anymore because the reviews have not been great. I haven't had a chance with everything going on. I haven't had a chance to go see Minions yet. But those that have have been saying it's, <laughs> yes. it's really not all that good. So I, I don't know if it's going to have a high rewatchability factor, but super huge. Now on Mailbag, Mailbag's back by the way, guys. On Mailbag on Saturday, I, somebody asked if uh, I thought Jurassic World would catch Titanic for the number two spot. And I said, I'll be honest, I'm not even sure Jurassic World is going to catch Avengers for the number three spot. Um, because I think this weekend will be the first weekend that we see a big nosedive in its, uh, in its, in its financial returns. And that is not the case. It only dropped an, another 38 point something percent down to about 18 million, which is still really respectable. I, I, and therefore now I think it's got a pretty decent chance of catching Avengers. I still don't think it's going to catch Titanic because not only now does it have much different competition, but opening this coming weekend is Ant-Man, which is going to, I think, really put the brakes on Jurassic World. Um, and the other thing that stands out a lot to me is Selfless. Ryan Reynolds has a lot of buzz around him. We knew the returns weren't going to be great on Selfless. They have not marketed this film well. They haven't marketed it much. But still, Ryan Reynolds, um, you think it Gandhi, you think <laughs> it's going to be all right. And I, it played on over 2,000 screens and only made about 5 million bucks. So that stands out to me a little bit. So I, I, didn't, I thought it would beat the Gallows. And Gallows, congrats, comes in number five, 10 million bucks, very respectable. So that's pretty good. I mean, Mark, you s saw the results. What do you think? Yeah, what sense to you? Many of the, I knew Minions would do well, but I didn't know that it would beat Inside Out's opening weekend take, and it did, which is shocking to me. Because if you take your kids to see Inside Out, they're going to learn something. If you take your kids to see Minions, they're probably going to get dumber for the next like couple <laughs> days. But it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's fun, mindless entertainment for kids, I think. Minions dis disappointed me critically, but there's such an appeal to these little guys. They're the best best part of the Despicable Me franchise, and so it's not totally surprising. What I will say is that I think the drop-off from week one to week two with Minions is going to be huge, and I think that Inside Out might still be able to retain the overall box office win versus the other animated film, because I think Inside Out is going to hold stronger week to week to week than Minions will. Uh, Jurassic World, I mean, obviously, it's still, it's still a juggernaut, and The Gallows, I, I thought that a horror film opening like that that was marketed well, I thought, would have done a little bit more than $10 million. And, John, you're right about Selfless. I, 
I like Selfless. I thought it was a cool, different take. It felt like a fun '90s action flick, and for like, I never saw a commercial for it on TV. I just like, I wasn't aware that the movie was coming out, and this is what I do for a living. So <laughs> it was a little shocking to me. I th I honestly thought for a while, up until just a number of weeks ago, I honestly thought for a while it was going to be a straight to home video. A straight to VOD kind of thing, and I guess right now, whenever people think of Ryan Reynolds, all they're thinking is Deadpool. Anyway, Dennis, what did you think? I think Minions is it, it's going to be a juggernaut. I think it's going to I think it's going to uh, outperform Inside Out just because I haven't seen it yet. So maybe my my uh, enthusiasm will be tempered after I see it. But I just feel like remember with Despicable Me uh, one and two, just how much through the weeks. It just it kept going mm -hmm. and it going likes. and going. And I think Minions is going to do the same thing. As far as uh, Selfless, yeah, wasn't aware of it at all. When it kind of just popped up on our radar, we barely heard about it. And it does look like a, a VOD direct-to-home video movie. And I still don't really know what it's about. They didn't really market it. It's um, Tarsum Singh is yes, the director. Right. Yes. Just Which not is kind of a red flag. Yeah, you know, not really me. a fan of his fan of his work. So I, I think they knew it, and they're just like, forget it. Let's not waste any money marketing this movie. Let's just you know see what we can get out of it. And and the gallows, it, it, they, I thought it was marketed pretty well. Uh, even though I'm not a horror fan, it actually interests me enough to maybe think about seeing it. I really want to see the gallows, and I missed it because of Comic Con. And every year during Comic Con, there's always one of those movies that comes out that they kind of release during Comic Con, so you forget about it. And it, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it was selfless, and it has been a Ryan Reynolds film in the past. When R.I.P.D. came oh, out, yeah. they released mm, that the weekend at right. Comic-Con, hoping nobody would review it or even pay attention to it, because that apparently was terrible, too. I missed R.I.P.D., thankfully, but I like selfless, so if you haven't seen it, it I think it's worth checking out. Yeah, one of the things that, that I was worried about Minions going in was that I, I love the Minions, but I always thought Minions are amazing secondary characters. The Despicable Me movies work because of Gru, and then you had the Minions playing off Gru, doing the little things on the side, and they were great accents. And I always was worried that, can these accents actually be the main driving force of the movie? And talking to Christian after he saw it, that's mm -hmm. the first thing he said to me, he goes, he goes, you totally felt the absence of Gru in this. So you can't base something on these guys alone. Uh, so again, I haven't seen it, but yeah, we'll see. What I, I think those little guys can carry their own movie. It just has to be a better film. Like they can't carry crap. You know, they can carry something good, but there's just not a lot of story in there. If you give them a better story, I think they can do their own film. All right, folks. Well, we are going to now spend the rest of our show talking about Comic-Con and it's more specifically talking about all the things that happened at Comic-Con regarding the movie world, and maybe not all of them, we don't have that much time, but we're going to talk about the main movie things. And joining us on the panel right now, for the first time ever, she's basically like our operations administrator. Wendy Lee is here, everybody. Wendy's, he's, Wendy's been with us for a while now, behind the scenes, uh, doing a lot of the uh, behind the scenes stuff that we need done around here, and she kind of helps keep this ship running. But she was in Hall H for the full Saturday run, which is basically when most of the good stuff happened. Mm -hmm. I should mention that on Friday, Star Wars did have a panel, uh, and Harrison Ford, as predicted, came out on stage, which knew they didn't show a trailer, which we knew, but they did show like this behind the scenes kind of footage. We're gonna kind of table that since there's not really any news that came out, and, and I'm sure you're gonna hear me, Mark, and Christian talk an awful lot about it come Jedi Council on Thursday, so tune in Jedi Council on Thursday. We're basically gonna mainly focus on the stuff that happened in there on Saturday. So let's get started with this. Batman versus Superman comes out. Now, let's talk about the panel itself. I was not in the room. I'm the only guy who wasn't in the room because I was back actually working at the house doing like mailbag and stuff. Um, so, Mark, let's start with you. What were some of the things? Tell us a little bit about the panel for those who couldn't be there. What happened? What stood out to you about the panel? What were some of the highlights? Um, Aisha Tyler was moderating the panel, and she did a magnificent job bringing everybody on stage, and you got pretty much the full cast out there. You got to see Superman and Batman on stage hanging out, having a couple laughs together. Jeremy Irons came out, and she forgot to introduce Jeremy Irons, <laughs> and so he kind of just, like, walked see, that out. that goes against your opening statement of her doing a really great job. It, 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 you can mess <laughs> you you had one job, introduce the cast. <laughs> when you're moderating a panel, you can mess up as long as you laugh about it. Yes. And you can clearly tell that she's a geek at heart and she likes all this stuff. So seeing them out there and having them talk about the project a little bit, Zack Snyder was the most impressive to me because he seems to have such a handle on this material and he really seems to grasp what he wants to do with this film. 
and it seemed like the cast was on board with everything he was talking about. And so I liked watching the panel, and then when they showed the actual footage, you could tell the fan response to this thing is huge. It was one of the biggest applauses that I heard in Hall H all weekend, and I was sitting right up close enough to where the speakers actually like will blow your hair back <laughs> when something big happens on the screen. So it was a really fun panel to be a part of. Dennis, we'll start to you about the panel. Well, speaking of Zack Snyder, he actually drove the Batmobile at the night before right. while everyone was waiting for, for Hall H. Uh, what stood out to me was when Ben Affleck came out, there was a good amount of applause for him. So I feel like the tide is turning now for Ben Affleck as Bruce Wayne slash Batman, that people are now embracing him, seeing the trailer, seeing that he's coming out, knowing that he's a big fan of Batman and the franchise. And it, I think it's one of those things by the time... The movie comes out, and he, and hopefully he kills it. People are going to forget about all the, the controversy about casting him. Wendy? And, yeah, yeah. Oh. and I just want to point out real quick, Ben Affleck told a hilarious story about running into Christian Bale at a <laughs> Halloween costume store. when the, right At after, a Halloween costume store. At, after Affleck was cast, he said he went with his kid to go get, because his kid wanted to be Batman for Halloween, so he went to a costume store in L.A., and in the aisle where they had the Batman costumes, he turns around, and Christian Bale is right there taking his kid shopping. And so they just no had this way. awkward conversation. And it was it was just a hysterical story to hear. Yeah, so he was fun. And and both him and Cavill really had fun with the fans and they seemed to be enjoying themselves at the at at Comic Con. He also had a great story about how Zack Snyder was telling him how he would be how uh, Ben Affleck was perfect for Batman because he's, he's like, yeah, we need someone that's kind of like old, tired, <laughs> run down, yeah. uh, over the hill, burnt out. And he's like, oh, great. You me. <laughs> Wendy, what, what did you take away from that panel? I was, well, it was my first Hall H ever. So I was already excited. And I told Dennis right before we went out, I was like, you're probably going to see me cry <laughs> a lot. And I didn't cry. But I was looking forward to not only seeing Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck on stage, I was really looking forward to the new trailer because I knew it was going to be exclusive and I was going to be bragging to everybody. Hey, <laughs> guess what? I saw the trailer and then they dropped it on the internet <laughs> like two minutes after. I was like, well, okay. Well, yeah, let's talk then about the trailer a little bit. Now, I, for those of you who see, I put up my reaction video to the trailer that I made 30 seconds after watching it. <laughs> um, it is the best trailer we've, we've had in years. I honestly believe that. I think that is the best trailer we've had in years. I lost my freaking mind over this trailer. I want to run down some of the key things that are that are in that trailer that I thought were really rather interesting, some really cool shots. Number one to me was Ben Affleck in this trailer. There, first of all, we got to hear a lot of dialogue from him, but to me, what really captures the essence of what's everything was that shot of Ben Affleck in the street looking up at the building coming down. And guys, watch the trailer again and again and again, and just on that one spot, and just watch every little muscle and every little twitch. He uses his entire face just to act that scene out. And as you look at that face, that is the face of a really pissed off Batman. <laughs> the, when he sees both, both the both terror and concern and rage and anger all melded into one. That shot says reminds me a lot of that from the first trailer when Jeremy Irons is giving that speech about good men become cruel and that one shot was an Affleck face. I was blown away by what they did with that. But we got to see that and I put a post on my Facebook page that said, do you hear all those crickets? That's the sound of all the Affleck casting Batman haters right about now. <laughs> and and that that's pretty much the truth of it. So I thought he looked great. I am... At first, I felt a little concerned that they seemed to be hiding Gal Gadot in the trailer. We didn't see any acting from her. We didn't see any lines. But at the same time, why should we expect that? If if we're right in our assumption that she actually plays a very small role, because when when a filmmaker says a very important role, that means small. <laughs> um, so I, I have a feeling she actually plays a small role. So really, why should we have expected to see anything in the trailer? So I don't think there's anything to be encouraged by or anything to be discouraged by uh, the Galgo thing at this point. The Robin outfit, huge, yeah. huge. Because they did a couple of amazing things with that Robin outfit. Number one, the Joker message spray painted on it. Ha ha, jokes on you, Batman. I mean, that, so Joker killed Robin. Joker killed Robin. But one of the things, and I've always been against Robin being in the DC Cinematic Universe. But I did put out a video a while ago say, here's how you could do work at work. Don't have a child Robin. Make it an adult Robin and you're good to go. And that was the suit of an adult. 
I mean, when you look at that suit with arms like this and whatever, that was a suit of an adult. And the other thing that makes it really good is that Robin is clearly dead. So uh, that's that's pretty cool, too. Um, some people speculating that the little girl that Bruce was hugging in the street might be the Jenna Malone character. I can understand why your mind would first go there. But remember, the events, we're, we're now only like a year separated from those events. Jenna Malone did not age 27 years. That little <laughs> yeah. girl did not age 27 years between that hug and and when we when we, whatever role she's going to play in the new movie. I, anyway, there are probably a, a dozen other things. I was blown away by it. The movie might suck, all right? So I love the Transformers trailers, and look how that turned out. So it could suck. All I can say, though, is I'm blown away by the trailers. Dennis, what stood out? Your impre- First of all, we haven't asked you what your impressions of the trailer are, what stood out to you about it. What did you think? I loved it. It was definitely my favorite trailer of, of Comic-Con. And speaking of that scene, like when, when the building's falling, he's hugging it and the girl and looking, they have the voiceover of, Hol- of Holly Hunter over it. It's like uh, talking about Superman and saying, we're going to hold you responsible. And then you're kind of they showing Bruce Wayne and, you know, they're inferring that he's holding Superman yes. responsible, and that's kind of where the conflict is. Yeah, I, there's so many things. We saw General Zod's uh, body, dead body. We don't yeah. know how that's going to mm-hmm. play into it. Is that going to factor into the kryptonite, we, which we also saw? Um, a lot of people were talking bad about Jesse Eisenberg and Lex Luthor. And mm. his, I, I didn't mind it. I mean, I didn't like the silly wig, <laughs> but I didn't mind his actual performance. And then, yeah, just like all the scenes. I mean, of course, we have to talk about the ending of the trailer where Superman rips open the Batmobile, Batmobile. and they get up and they just look at each other. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I thought it was fantastic. I've seen it like four or five times now. And there's there's so many little reveals in it little tiny things that you look at and you're like oh this means that this means that and i thought there was so much information packed in such a short amount of time mark watching that and when when he rips off the top of the batmobile and they stand and look at each other i got the feels and i yeah. knew that this movie is not gonna suck this is gonna be <laughs> great because the movie's called what batman v superman right who are the stars of this trailer batman and superman the yeah. ben affleck scene not only all the cool facial twitches he's doing when he's running towards that smoke and everybody oh. else is running there you can feel the superhero in him being reborn and coming out running into the face of danger i was not as thrilled seeing Wonder Woman and seeing Lex Luthor in that trailer because it just felt like, look guys, we have more than enough material with Batman and Superman in here alone. So how I, I it, it looks like Lex is going to play some role in maybe obtaining kryptonite to help battle Superman. I don't know. And then it, I just, I don't know that Wonder Woman shot of her in action and blowing some stuff up looked cool, but I just don't know how you're going to wedge that into this movie in a way that's not going to take away from the Batman v Superman that I'm so excited about. So I, I didn't hate seeing them in the trailer, but they just just didn't seem to fit in there it feel it felt a little bit like putting the square peg in a round hole to me overall though i thought that trailer was fantastic it gave us fans what we wanted to see wendy you were sitting in hall h and you got to see your reaction to it uh the trailer was epic it's everything i expected and a little more i actually liked seeing wonder woman because i was very curious to see what she was going to look like i thought she looked great in the costume but it didn't really depict how she's going to portray the character and I'm still a little worried about that because Wonder Woman is very iconic and important to a lot of people. So I guess we just have to wait and see. Uh, I'm really excited to see Gotham and Metropolis coming together in the film. Right. Yeah. That was another important information that came out from Zack Snyder at the panel is that he said that they're 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 twin cities. It's almost like a San Francisco and Oakland situation <laughs> where Metropolis is the is the really nice built up city, and then across the bay is Gotham, which is more run down. So maybe you work in Metropolis and then you go back to your home in Gotham. Well, it makes more sense because how is that fight between Zod and Superman affecting Gotham right. if they're so far away? They have to be close together. And one thing I do have a little concern with is I like the way they set up Lex Luthor in the sense of it seems like he wants to pit Superman versus Batman. Like he's trying to be like like the puppet master behind the scenes. The one thing I don't want to see is because there's a shot of him and Superman. Superman's kind of like almost bowing to Lex Luthor. I don't want this kryptonite to like somehow be some sort of mind control thing over Superman. And that, See, I don't and think that, it is. I hope not. But I was just concerned because of the, the him bowing to him. See, here's the thing. I, the, the impression I got from the trailer, and we're making such big theories based yes. on three <laughs> minutes of footage, but what the impression I got from the trailer is I don't think, I don't think Lex Luthor is trying to pit him against Batman at all. Mm-hmm. I think to Lex Luthor, Batman's an afterthought. The, what I got from that scene where he's bowing and then he looks up to Lexi and he does not look happy. No. He is somehow being, I don't think it's mind control. I think there's almost an ethical um, uh, 
binding on him. Could this be that the Senate passed some kind of thing and said, okay, Lex Luthor, you are you're going to answer to Lex Luthor. If you really want us to trust you and you say you're an American, blah, blah, then you're going to answer to Lex Luthor. We're going to put Lex Luthor in charge. I think those Superman soldiers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they're Lex, Lex's people. Mm -hmm. That scene that we see... Uh, Superman come down thing and the the Lex or the Superman soldiers kneel. When you when they show the shot of then Superman's face, he looks disgusted by the whole thing. He doesn't like it at all. So I think there's some kind of setup here which would be consistent with the Dark Knight Returns, right. in which Superman's like, I'm honor and duty bound to follow the laws of the United States, and they're telling me to go get Batman. And I got a feeling there's a little bit of that in this. They showed shots of the Batwing flying over the city, and you see uh, the city like massive amounts of fire and destruction. That's probably our doomsday scenario. Mm. That's probably our Zod, the D either the DNA from Zod or the reanimated body of Zod or something like that. Because that one shot of, you see Batman hanging on the, on the edge of the building and then swings out of the way before a heat blast hits it, right? I got a feeling that wasn't Superman sending off that heat blast. Mm. I think the trailer made it look like it was. But I don't think that's actually what it was. I think it's this is going to be our doomsday scenario. But who knows? Could be a million miles off on that. Yeah, a fan tweeted me a theory about maybe they take General Zod's dead body and they reanimate it to become whatever they're going to call doomsday right. in, the, in the future. So I, I don't know. That could happen, maybe. And that's probably what Wonder Woman is. Whatever it is that threw Wonder Woman back against those brick walls. It's probably not either Batman or Superman. That's probably our doomsday scenario, I would think. All right, let's move on to the next thing. Another big thing that they showed off at the panel that uh, everybody was very excited to see, very curious to see, was Ryan Reynolds and Deadpool. So, Dennis, let's start with you. The, the, first of all, who was on the panel? Did they have most of the cast, whatever? And yeah, what they came had out most of, that of the panel? cast. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, obviously, T.J. Miller, Marina Baccarin, uh, Gina Carano. Uh, yeah, everyone was there. What came off, they, they actually started the panel off with a video, and but it wasn't the trailer. It was like this video of Deadpool sitting in a chair and like with smoking a pipe and talk. He was kind of making fun of the fact that it, this is coming from the same studio that sewed Deadpool's mouth shut in, in <laughs> X-Men Origins. So they kind of started off with that and they just came out and... You can tell Ryan Reynolds is super excited about doing this movie and doing it right. And I have to say, as, as much applause and as happy as people were with the Batman v Superman trailer, the crowd was even louder for the Deadpool trailer. It was a standing ovation. After the trailer was done, people went nuts. So I, 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 I really, and I also really liked it. Which came first? The uh, Warner Brothers was in the morning. Yes. So Warner Brothers came first. Mark, your reaction to the, to the, what stood out to you about the panel and of course the, your reaction to the trailer? I echo Dennis's sentiments entirely. This stole the entire weekend for me because I've never seen before. Sometimes they will play a trailer twice and they plan on doing that. They did not plan on playing the, Dead uh, the Deadpool trailer twice, but the fans mm -hmm. started chanting one more time. 6,000 people chanting one more time, and they had to do an encore, and Chris Hardwick was moderating. He's like, hey, you know what? I'm the guy with the microphone. I have the power to do this right now. <laughs> Play it again. And we all went crazy again because it was that good. The panel was hysterical. The panel was so in the style of the Deadpool character because it was a rated R panel. Yeah. There was a lot of salty oh, yeah. language on stage. <laughs> there was a hilarious running joke between Hardwick and TJ Miller, who are both comedians. They're both really good buddies, just joking about some equestrian stuff that yes. I won't get into. <laughs> Equestrian on equestrian stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, human on equestrian yeah. stuff. A lot of things going on. But Ryan Reynolds was so engaged in what this character was, and he just seems to have such a grip. The entire team up there on stage seems to have such a great grasp on what they want to do with Deadpool that it is this R-rated guy that the Merc with the mouth gets really dirty sometimes, and it's going to be action-packed and violent, and they, they kept celebrating the fact that it was an R-rated movie. So I think that this was the... This was the, the the show stealer of Hall H the entire week. What were your reactions to it, and what stood out to you, Wendy? Uh, well, I went into Hall H anticipating Batman v Superman the most, and then they showed Deadpool, and then it was I couldn't shut up about it afterwards with Dennis. I just kept on talking about it all mm -hmm. day. After seeing that leaked uh, animated test footage from, was it two years ago? I, I knew that once Ryan Reynolds was tweeting out how much he is excited and it was going to be a hard R movie, that I was like, this is going to be the most epic comic book movie for next year. And now it's my most anticipated for next year. You would say it's even more anticipated for you than Batman v Superman. It's like, I would say equal to my anticipation for Avengers. 
wow. from First Avengers, and that's wow. and that's big. Now, so the trailer, a leaked version of the trailer, mm. get out online. Looks really. I love the Rosie O'Donnell line. By the way, <laughs> the, the, that's angry Rosie O'Donnell. But when I when I first, I think Dennis, you were the first one to tell me about it about how Ryan Reynolds. Look, if you were going to have script out the perfect way to open up a panel on Deadpool, have Ryan Reynolds completely attack the thing that we all attack the most. Yes. Fox so shut the mouth of the Merc with the mouth. How can you, how do you get that wrong? How do you get and the fact that they he immediately went after that and poked fun at it? I think it was just the best thing you could do. And he took jabs at Green Lantern too. Yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> yeah. he did. It's the perfect mechanism for for how, if you get in front of something before anybody else can attack it, then that's such a great way to defuse the situation. I mean, and even in the trailer, he makes fun of Green Lantern too when he says he's about to become this. They're they're about to do all these experiments on him. He's like, okay, just don't make my suit green and animated or animated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't make my suit green or. Animated. Animated, and we're good to go. All right, let's move on to this. It wasn't just comic book movies in Hall H, ladies and gentlemen. Quentin Tarantino came, and they did themselves a panel for Hateful Eight. Now, from what I understand, they did show a trailer, but it was just basically kind of a little bit of an extended version of the one that we already had. But still, seeing this crew together and Quentin Tarantino on stage at Comic-Con, I know you're a huge Quentin Tarantino fan. What came out of that panel and what stood out to you? Well, the first off, they showed a video, much like with Deadpool before the, the panel actually started, with Sam Jackson saying he wish he could be there. And he interests, and he starts talking about all, basically 70 millimeter and talking about all, how great it was. It's almost like kind of a history lesson about <laughs> it. And then Quentin Tarantino comes out and he talks a lot about it and talks about how the lenses that they used on it weren't just the same kind that they used for the Ben-Hur chariot scene, but that they were the same lens that they used for Ben-Hur. Like, like they actually the, went and dug up the exact same the lenses? Exact yeah. same, he said they, they only exist one, so you have to use those. So wow. he was really big on that stuff. He talked a lot about, you know, there, were, there was an interview a, a few months back about him saying he was going to maybe retire after doing 10 films. Right. He kind of backtracked a little bit, said, look, that's just something I thought would might be kind of a cool idea. But, you know, I might go down to 12 or 13, 14, 15 movies. And even, you know, he's a big proponent of film, but he was talking about like even like maybe he'll he didn't even say the word that he would do digital, but he just kind of almost hinted like but at that point, maybe I'll do some television or something like that, because he feels like shooting on digital and show projecting digital is like he called it HBO in public. So he, he he said that he thinks maybe someday in the far, far future that he would work on a television mini miniseries. And, I, you know, he was kind of half joking, but I think he's kind of half serious as well. And as far as the movie's concerned, yeah, it's the thing that I, I guess I didn't know coming into it, it's all set in like mostly set in one location. So it's kind of like a Reservoir Dogs right. where it's like you get all these kooky kind of characters together and then they kind of have like dramatic tension. It almost felt like a murder mystery to me. Yeah. I don't know. What'd you think, Mark? I was going to say it felt like an Old West version of Clue. And I'm yeah. like, I'm so <laughs> in on this. And by the way, that opening video you're talking about, if Sam Jackson ever becomes a visiting professor at a university <laughs> teaching history, take that class. He is hysterical. Quentin Tarantino has so much passion and it just bled through the entire panel, even through the fan questions. A lot of cool things about these panels come out through fans getting to ask their heroes a question. And one of them asked, hey, would you ever consider doing another Kill Bill? And Tarantino said, hey, I'd be open to it. You know, So that was an interesting tidbit. And he also gave us something right at the end, after they showed the footage, he said that doing the score for The Hateful Eight is the legendary Western composer, Ennio, I can't... It's, Maricone. There you go, Maricone, yeah. Who did The, the Good, The Bad, The Ugly, and that... You you know, the Ecstasy of Gold is one of his many famous scores, so that's going to be an awesome thing. And then when you actually see the trailer, all of these all of these huge sweeping shots using those Panavision lenses that are so famous, and then you get to meet each one of the Hateful Eight, and most of them were on stage, too. Watching Kurt Russell and, like, what a ball that guy was having sitting next to Quarantino. Uh, to Quarantino? <laughs> I think it just came up with the best hashtag <laughs> for sure. Yeah. When you just his name. name together. Yeah. But you get to see all these guys hanging out on stage and then the characters that they leap into on the screen. It was a really neat experience. And this thing comes out Christmas Day only in 70 millimeter. And then it comes out in like other formats. Like 100 theaters or something Right, like that. right. So this is definitely going to be one of the ones that you want to see as soon as you you can get your hands on it. When do your reaction to the Hateful Eight stuff? I was really looking forward to it. It's been a while since we've gotten a Tarantino film, and I'm a fan, so I think the last one was Django. Yep. Was that the was the last, last Quarantino ago. film. Yes, yeah. the right. last Quarantino film. <laughs> so I, I felt like I, I wanted more, and Dennis and I were talking about how it was actually a really long presentation on screen, mm -hmm. but I 
I just needed more from the story because they focus so much on each character and I wanted to see more interaction between the eight. Yeah, it was a lot of setup. It was a long seven minutes, but it was a lot of just setup. It wasn't a lot of action. They're just kind of setting up who these characters are. And it looks like Jennifer Jason Lee is kind of the focal point of the storyline. They're, 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 uh, I think Kurt Russell's character is taking her to be hanged. Right. And, and then these other characters kind of get into the mix. And then speaking of the in, Ennio Marconi stuff, yeah, he did uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. He wow. Did, like mm. some of his I, most iconic Western themes. And then my favorite use of Tarantino using his uh, songs is in uh, Kill Bill, the first one. It, he uses that uh, Death Rides a Horse right before the battle at the House of the Blue Leaves. When he co- when she comes out, the bride comes out and chops off um, that one lady's arm and the blood spills out and you can hear the music rising. So the fact that he is going to do an original score for, for Tarantino, I, I, I'm i super excited. One of the things that, that's sensitive to me that I think they're making a mistake on, I wasn't in the panel for this, but I feel like Tarantino and the wine scenes are making a mistake by they're trying to make the 70 millimeter thing a big part of their marketing in this mm-hmm. film. Mistake. Nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares. There's there the I, I think I feel like it's like the the one percent who have read those back issues of Superman to worry about does Superman do this in the movie? Because this is the one percent of people who will care about the 70 millimeter stuff. I mean, so I I don't I think I'm not I don't mean that means it's a mistake to use it. Yeah. I mean it's a mistake to try to spend a lot of time making it your big. Focal this is point. our big gimmick. This is our big look, folks. Like nobody will care. I don't think. I also think you're right about Quentin Tarantino. He's not going to stick to this. I'll never shoot on digital thing. Yeah. He won't. It's it'll be the same thing as him saying I'm not doing any more movies or or him going I'm not doing more ten or him going well I'm not going to make hateful eight anymore yeah. or uh, well yeah sure but eventually <laughs> you start to recognize and see oh wait the new media is actually really really good and really really easy to shoot with and does some really cool things and that doesn't mean you don't love the old stuff that you used to do but I think at some point he will come to his senses and start so shooting too. stuff. And I think it will be in a TV format. I really do. Just hearing him talk about how, why would I limit myself? If I have to do this format I'm not crazy about, why would I limit myself to telling a story that has to be two and a half hours when I can do a miniseries that's eight or ten hours? Uh, another film, folks, that they highlighted in Hall H was the new um, Guillermo del Toro film, Crimson Peak, a horror film. Most of us know nothing about it except for that trailer that dropped a little while ago. Wendy, you were in there, part of the panel. What did we learn about Crimson Peak? That it's going to be in the style that everybody knows. Um, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be really, really creepy, and this time in English. <laughs> <laughs> What stood to you on the panel? What did you learn? Uh, the, the Del Toro kept referring to this film not as a horror movie, but as a gothic romance. And I thought that was really interesting wow. because you had uh, Hiddleston and Wasikowski who were going to be getting together, and then Jessica Chastain, the creepy sister, and it seems like sister and brother have some sort of plot that they're recruiting Maya for. And this trailer was the best that I've seen because it was creepier. It was a little bit scarier than the other trailers, which I was complaining about simply because the movie looks cool. It looks visually amazing, but it just didn't really terrify me at all. And maybe that's not the primary goal of this film, which is an interesting twist on it. It's a haunted house movie for sure. There's going to be a lot of ghosts. There's going to be a lot of demons running around this place. But it also is aiming to have higher uh, goals than to just jump scare. It's 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 telling a really intricate story here too, and that's what I took away from this panel. The other thing I took away from this panel is that Tom Hiddleston literally can walk up to any female, <laughs> anywhere in the entire world, and have her in the palm of his hand <laughs> if he so chooses. He doesn't need to be wearing the Loki costume on stage to get a huge reaction. Everybody loves that dude. You know, it's really funny. I always thought that the the hallmark of a really good horror film are the films that understand that good horror throw a wrench in the equilibrium of your emotional state. And I remember watching the trailer for uh, Crimson Peak, and like, there's no huge set pieces of, hey! you know, but I, I remember from second one, there was a wrench in the equilibrium of my emotional state. <laughs> like something just felt weird and creepy and off about it, and it just made me yearn to kind of see the movie. And Dennis, you saw the panel. What stood out to you? Yeah, with the trailer, it was just an extended trailer, so it was some of the stuff we've already seen, but a little bit more. I like that it's more focused on the storyline and. And just the atmosphere, it kind of, I like my horror movies to be more creepy than the jump scare or bloody mm-hmm. or anything like that. I like that creepy factor, and this has it. He also talked about, it was mostly a Q&A session, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. He talked about uh, how gorgeous it was. A lot of people asked him about the production design. He actually said it's in his top three movies that he's ever done. 
So that that's saying a lot. So right. I'm I'm excited for it. Yeah, and Hiddleston mentioned that they did build this giant set to shoot the interiors of the mansion, and that it was actually three or four stories big, and and it did have a working elevator and everything. And so you really did the actors could feel like they were in this confined space, and that it got pretty creepy on set. So that's always good when you're going into this. I love the phrase, by the way, threw a wrench in the equilibrium of my emotional state. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the horror movie version of "There's been an awakening." Like that's. Cool. Cool. He also says it was gonna, it's going to be a gender liberated film, and it's not going to be a damsel in distress type of thing. And he also announced that uh, uh, Wendy, you, you have a part in this. Uh, the yeah. the Crimson Peak is going to be at uh, the Universal Halloween Horror Nights. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, I mean, he released that, and uh, I'm very friendly with people over at Universal Studios. So that was the first official Maze announcement for HHN this year. And everybody actually tweeted me during during the during the panel. Did you hear? Did you hear? Is it confirmed? Is it confirmed? And I was like, Yep. Yeah, he just said it on stage. And then a second later, I got an email from Universal. You know, Guillermo. Guillermo. Whoa. I'm just not even gonna say his name. <laughs> Confirms the maze. Um, all right. There were a couple of other. The three left that we have left were all very big, very highly anticipated. We got to start with uh, you know Fox talking X-Men. So, Mark, they came out. They First of all, who, who came out on the panel that was of note? What did they reveal? I understand they might have showed you the, the, some art from, from Apocalypse himself. Mm -hmm. What did you get out of it? Everybody came out, man. The, yeah. the, it was, the, I think, the entire cast of X-Men Apocalypse minus the extras, and the panel was kicked <laughs> off by Hugh Jackman coming on stage. And then Hugh Jackman, he, 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 he made something funny that was that everybody is now treating as him confirming Old Man Logan, which isn't necessarily so. uh, the case yet because he was joking. They showed some some footage of him auditioning to play Wolverine. And then he said, man, I was looking at that and man, have I aged. You're talking <laughs> about old man Logan. And then the crowd went crazy and he's like, read into that what you want. But he he did it with a wink and a nod. He brought Brian Singer out and then they had this weird interaction that, that Singer is just kind of squirrely and so it wasn't, a, it was a little clumsily handled, but it looked like they were joking about, hey Hugh, uh, I, I still got your number, right? Uh, maybe I'll give you a call about some Thing in the future, but Hugh Jackman brought out the cast for X-Men Apocalypse, and then Hugh exited the stage. So there's no confirmation that you are going to see Wolverine in X-Men Apocalypse. I still think it's going to happen, but there was nothing mentioned of that. But seeing all these guys on stage together, Chris Hardwick is like, look, we have so many people to get to. We're just going to kind of run down who your character is and just give us a little taste of this. Because Singer mentioned that they've only been shooting for about five weeks, yet they already cut together a really neat teaser trailer and you got to see apocalypse in the makeup i thought they were just going to hint at it that you might see like a, a cape swirl or something you get to see the dude's face you get to see oscar isaac as apocalypse and he looks so menacing the other takeaway from this trailer i had is that magneto seems to be torn initially as to what he's going to be doing what his role is going to be good guy villain somewhere in between by the end of the trailer it looks like he's teamed up and he is apocalypse's boy going against the x-men and then that final scene you get james McAvoy finally cutting his hair, running the razor over his dome. This young, bald, wheelchair bound Professor X. Dennis, what stood out to you? I had the opposite reaction to that trail that you did, oh, Mark. Wow. Yeah, I was very underwhelmed. I almost felt like they shouldn't have shown it. Or if they had, they should have hit an apocalypse because I did not like the look of apocalypse. He, I thought when I watched, I was like, is that Mr. Freeze up there from Batman and Robin? <laughs> and then people were tweeting me because I didn't watch Power Rangers, but this, people were saying he looked like someone called Ivan Ooze or something like that. And I, I looked him up and I was like, yeah. Yeah, he kind of looks like that. He, he looks small. Look, I know he probably might be able to get bigger in the movie, but there's a shot of him in the hallway with some of the X-Men. I'm just, to me, he did not look intimidating. I think Oscar Isaac is, is a fantastic actor, and I think he will be able to portray that. I'm just talking about the visual look to him. He just doesn't look like, like Apocalypse is supposed to kind of look like almost like this giant alien in a way, right? And he's supposed to be very menacing. I didn't get that from, from what I saw, so I was extremely disappointed. Well, so, they also mentioned that they didn't that, that that these that some of the effects in even these shots that we're seeing are necessarily finished. So I don't know if there's going to be some sort of mocap or CGI element to Apocalypse. You're right, Dennis. It didn't look like it looked like that was the finished product yeah. that they're going to be going into battle with. I thought he looked cool, but you know. So so let me get this straight. And Wendy, you can speak this. So the the Apocalypse that we saw, not we, I didn't see it. The <laughs> Apocalypse that got shown. That was Oscar Isaac in oh, yeah. costume was, and makeup. Yeah, it was not a CG character? No. no. No, and I feel like I was excited with Dennis. I was really excited up until they showed Apocalypse. And I was like, yeah, oh. And he's standing in a hallway. It's kind of anticlimactic. 
next to Storm and Psylocke, and he's about their height. See, t- I, okay, I'm really disappointed by that because Apocalypse is supposed to be giant and huge and menacing and all this kind of stuff. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have a really cool take on it right. and that I, this may be my favorite movie you know, villain of all time once I see it, but my initial reaction is disappointment. I assumed they would do him CGI well, without actually doing the mocap and, and the voice. I, I think they'll probably incorporate elements of that later, so I, I just think that this is, they really wanted to show us something at Comic-Con and the tease we got, I, I was very accepting of. I, I thought it was awesome. Another concern I have is that the way they're portraying the power of his character is like he's controlling the minds of of the, all the X-Men. I just don't like that when that comes to movies because I mentioned that before with the Batman v Superman because what it does, it takes away the free will of your characters, right? When you want characters to fight each other, right? They, they're they supposed to have a motivation. They're supposed to be like, well, I believe in this and this is why we're fighting. And that's what's so great about the Magneto Professor X relationship. You take someone like Apocalypse and he's if he's controlling the mind of whether it's the, the the mutants that are bad or good, they have no choice in the matter. He's just controlling them, and I, I don't like that as a plot device. We saw that in the first Avengers with Hawkeye. Yeah. We saw it in the second mm-hmm. Avengers. They did it again. We've seen it in many movies, and I, I agree with you. I think that's a cheap plot hook. Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully. All right, two more to go. Another one that Warner Brothers kind of showed off that got a lot of people buzzing about, of course, was Suicide Squad. And I know the biggest thing that came out of the Suicide Squad uh, presentation was was people talking Joker and stuff like that. Wendy, you got to see the Suicide Squad. First of all, w- what did they do on the panel? What did they talk about on the panel and then your reaction to the trailer? They brought out the whole cast. Everybody was there except for Jared Little. I don't Jared Little no, was, Jared not, yeah, was, was not, there. not there. Except the one that probably everybody wanted <laughs> to see the most. Yeah. I uh, I was actually really looking forward to Harley Quinn. Everybody loves Harley. And I was thinking, how in the world are they going to portray her? And the first shot of her was her hanging upside down her jail cell. And I was like, I'm done. That's it. I'm happy. I'm happy. Thank you. Good night. Yeah, <laughs> it was a little cool. Cirque du Soleil. It was yeah. nice seeing the entire cast walk on stage. And I didn't think, or I wasn't sure if Will Smith would show up or not, but he did. And he got on the mic just for a second to thank everybody. He's like, hey, no, it was it was like they, they painted it like the cast flew in that morning. And then as soon as they're leaving the stage, they're getting back on a plane, going back to Canada to finish shooting this thing, hopefully with less fan cell phones around. But even uh, <laughs> director David Ayer mentioned that he actually joked about that too. He came out and gave like this huge pump up pep talk yeah. about hey are you guys ready it's, it's time we're, we're done with superheroes it's time to get bad and the crowd was going crazy and then he's like he said something about marvel and he, and now he oh, said he yeah. didn't want to do an east coast west coast thing but oh, yeah. we're, but he, he just inferred that these are the movies that fans really want to see and so he started some beef and i like that i don't think <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to take that and run oh my god I did you hear this it was a fun thing to do an isolated event in hall h and then the trailer comes on and the trailer totally locked me into this movie. It gave me such a nice insight into what they're doing, where it's this this agency is going to try to get these villains, they're going to try to get bad people to go after even worse people, because if these people they recruit for these missions mess up, it's they're villains. That's what they're supposed to do. You know, it's like it's not our fault. They're bad guys. So um, this 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 movie looks looks incredible. It almost superseded what I saw with Batman v Superman. I'm such a huge Batman fan that of course I want to see that stuff on stage. And even got a quick glimpse. They mentioned Superman in this trailer, and you got to see that shot that we all saw, like the the iPhone coverage of the leak yeah. stuff. You got to see Batman on top of what appears to be Joker's car and Harley Quinn in the passenger seat. So they're gonna play some sort of role in this, but the villains are the star of this movie and i'm ecstatic about it so well, yeah david ayer came out and he pulled a suit tonight he basically called <laughs> out marvel he it was a west coast east coast thing because he right. was basically saying dc has the better villains he's mm-hmm. like i have to say it i got to speak the truth and he was you know he's swearing so that was the whole big thing with him and then we got to see the joker at the right. very end of the trailer and and you know i, I kind of rewatched some footage online i had already seen it in hall h and it, he reminded me, actually, of Robert De Niro's character in Cape Fear. Cape Fear, I was going to say yeah, that. He yeah, he had that kind of mannerism to him. So, he, And his voice was kind of a mix between Mark Hamill's Joker and, and Heath Ledger's. I'm super excited. I know some people are hating this new Joker. I, I really like it. Yeah, I, I got to say, when I saw it, that's exactly what I thought, the Cape Fear thing. And I thought about, it sounds like a mix between Heath Ledger and Mark mm-hmm. Hamill. I mean, see, <laughs> But when he says that line, I mean, first of all, it's the perfect line. Oh, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to hurt you really, mm-hmm. really bad. I mean, that's Joker. Yeah. And that's awesome. And then the look on his face as he's talking about that. And look, Ayer's not wrong. Marvel, I, I love 
most of the Marvel films. I love most of them. But where they usually have a little bit of a deficit is in their villains. Loki aside, I mean, and I'm sure, you know, um, uh, who's the gauntlet? Uh, who's going to have the gauntlet? Thanos. Thanos. I'm sure Thanos is going to end up being a great villain, but there's nothing to be excited about him about yet. We've just seen him sitting there and smiling a couple <laughs> of times, make one or two lines. I mean, so uh, up until this point, we really haven't seen it. DC does have themselves positioned here to really corner the market on having great villains. And I like what we saw from Joker. I understand it's not, what we saw is not enough probably to change the minds of people who have been hating on it yet. So let's wait to see a little bit more. For me, I really dug what I saw and, and I like the trailer. All right, last thing today, something I've been very, very curious about. I've been saying for a while that there is a movie coming that can redeem the entire notion of the video game movie. A movie that not only could re-energize and really bring about a golden age of video game movies, but also the fantasy sword and sandal kind of movies as well at the same time, and that is Warcraft. I'm hearing so much about this, about all the, the new technologies you, you, they're using to do it. They want this to feel like a completely immersive world. And yet other than some stills, which I've really liked the stills we've been seeing. I haven't seen much. You guys got to see some stuff in there. And I'm not hearing all glowing things. I don't, Dennis, you saw the footage. What did you think about what you saw from Warcraft? I mean, I enjoyed the footage and I liked it. I just wasn't blown away. I think I was expecting to be blown away by it. It looks very CG. And I know, especially the orc heavy scenes, it looked like cutscenes from cinematics of a video game. And that's kind of what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned that that we need to connect with these characters, especially the orc characters, because they are going to be fully CG. I mean, hopefully the performance capture is similar to what they're using for uh, Dawn of the Planet Apes, of the apes. If they pull off, like, with an what Andy Serkis did with that, where we connected with the Caesar character, if they can do that with, uh, I, you know, I haven't played the game, but uh, what's like a Dorothon? Is that the, the main orc's name? And Ogrim. Yeah. That, Ogrim. The problem for me, okay, I'm watching the trailer. I haven't seen, I haven't played the game. So I don't know who these characters are, and especially with the orcs. I'm like, I couldn't tell them apart. I'm sure when the movie happens, I'll have a better idea. But right now, I'm just a little concerned about the story and, and the characters. Wendy, you, you, I can't remember. Have you played World of Warcraft? Oh, yeah. Okay, so as, <laughs> as a World of Warcraft player and as somebody who you had your first experience now with this trailer, what was your reaction to it? I was first really excited, and as they showed more and more and more, I started to feel a little let down. Like Dennis said, it was like a very epic cinematic trailer for the game, and I wanted something to be a little bit more real, something that we can connect with that's just outside of just gameplay. And if I wanted to see a game trailer, I'm just going to go pick up the game again and start playing. And uh, the trailer didn't depict the storyline very well. It was a little confusing. It was a little long for my liking. So I'm just looking for, I'm hoping, crossing my fingers, that's still going to be good. You know, I'm a big fan of the franchise, so we'll see. I feel the same way as both of you. You, Schnapp, and I were talking about this last week, how the, what Warcraft has to do is please the fans of the game for sure, but it also has to cross over and appeal to people who have never played the game or had yeah. any desire to play the game. For it to be a successful venture, that's what it has to do. And Duncan Jones, the director, said exactly that when he was on the panel. So the panel was impressive to me. Then they showed the footage, and to echo Dennis's thoughts, I, it felt like I was, I was, it was like the intro to a video game, which was a bummer to me because a Especially the, the huge sweeping shots, it looked a lot more Hobbit Battle of the Five Armies than it did anything that you would see in a performance capture piece like Dawn or Rise of the Planet of the Apes. They're definitely trying to have an emotional arc with a with a family of orcs in particular, and I didn't feel it yet. And again, you're not supposed to just from a trailer, but there's going to be a huge battle between orcs and humans, and it's not going to be, oh, I'm rooting for this team or this team. There's going to be individuals on each side that are going to be good and you care about, and then there's also going to be, oh, man, that guy, that guy sucks. I, I don't like that guy. That's a villain. So... It, the 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 emotional complexity of this, I hope they're going to be able to pull off because I enjoyed watching it, but it did feel CG and it, it felt too much like I was in a video game, which is the primary goal of this game <laughs> is to show us that you're not just playing a video game. So. Primary goal of this movie oh, yeah. is not to show that you're just a video game. <laughs> I'm tired, man. It's been a long <laughs> been a four long. days for old Mark L. You know, I'm not going to panic at this point because this is still a movie that is still one year mm -hmm. away. And they specifically said they needed that extra year because they need Needed to get it right, that the technology, the visual effects that they're doing is, is like unlike anything that's ever been done before. So I'm going to maybe naively 
believe that, okay, so what we saw is probably not their finished product. I'm going to hope that at any rate. Talking about the, the need for emotional complexity. If anybody can bring that, I'm, I'm very confident Duncan Jones can. Like, if you watch Moon and what he was able to do emotionally with nobody, like with no <laughs> cast, just, and what he was able to do emotionally there, I, I have a lot of hope. So it's, it is, um, it's concerning to hear the reports I'm hearing from you guys about it, but I'm still going to hold that hope. I will, I will say the panel itself was entertaining. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the actors, Rob Kaczynski, he was talking about how he was a big player of, of WoW. And, and WoW is a game I purposely don't play, cause, not because I don't have a desire to, because I'm worried that I'm going <laughs> to live up your life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but he talked about how it took over his life and he lost the relationship over <laughs> it. How a girl broke up. And then late now he's like, I think it was Hardwick was moderating it with mm -hmm. him. And they were joking like, oh, now you can you have the last laugh. You can say, oh, that was all research for this role. <laughs> uh, and also Daniel Wu, who plays one of the, the orcs as well, talked about how he was supposed to take a break. Him and his wife agreed that, okay, after uh, one part that he had done, he's like, okay, for a year, I'm not going to work. We're going to you know focus on, on, on our child. And then he came home and told her, oh yeah, I'm going to audition for a movie. And she's like, no, you promised that we were going to take a break. And he's like, oh, but it's for Warcraft. And apparently she is the Warcraft it's player. It's Warcraft player. <laughs> Not him. Yeah. She. And she said, oh, you better effing do it. Yeah. And so he did, and he's in it. Mm -hmm. I know, look, me and my friends, going back like six, seven years ago, living in Canada, I, and I know there's a lot of you who can totally relate with what I'm about to say. On our desks for a long time, because you're not wrong about avoiding World of Warcraft. <laughs> my desk comprised of my computer with keyboard, uh, a loaf of bread with a knife, oh my God. a <laughs> jar of peanut butter, and a two liter bottle of Coke. Now, the two liter bottle, now all this, the, the, the peanut butter, the bread was sustenance, so you didn't have to leave the computer to go and eat. The two liter bottle of Coke was for no. liquid <laughs> and, and, and for caffeine to keep you going. And in the age of reuse, reuse, uh, recycle, um, once the bottle was empty, that then became what you stuck your dick in <laughs> and you peed. So you didn't have to get up and leave the computer. You're to like go. that guy from South Park. Yes. I, we were all, come on. There were so many of us. The only time that you had to leave the computers to get a new loaf of bread, empty out the two liter. <laughs> And get a new, fresh two liters. Like, it, that, I mean, come on, that was a lot of our lives. John Campia, not? you have thrown a wrench in the balance of my emotions. The equilibrium of your emotions. I mean, come on, that was a lot of us. Support me, guys. Jump in that comment section. So, yes, it would totally dominate and take over your life. Yeah. Completely would. All right, folks, listen, that'll do this all the time we have today for Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, if you guys were at Comic Con, Jump in the comment section. Let us know your reactions. Or if you weren't and you saw some of the online trailers, you're hearing us talk about it, also jump in the, in the uh, description below. Let Get the conversation going. Let us know your thoughts and everything. We want to hear from you. We didn't do mailbag today because we had a lot of stuff to cover, but don't worry. Mailbag will be back tomorrow on tomorrow's show. I want to thank the people sitting at the desk with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. Dennis Zen. Dennis, where can people find you on Twitter and social media? You guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And I want to thank all the guys who came out, to guys and gals that we met at Comic-Con at our meet and greet. So you're over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me sleeping for the next 48 <laughs> hours. You'll probably get a two-liter bottle of Coke near the bed. <laughs> Online at 5150 Ellis, Twitter and Instagram. And again, to echo everybody else's thoughts, you guys are the best fans in the world. Thank you so much for coming out and saying hi to us and just to keep on doing what you're doing. You rock. Of course, our mister over here, Miss Wendy Lee. Wendy, thanks for doing the show today. Thanks for and having me. Where can people follow you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram at Wendy Lee Zaney. And uh, you can find me and all the various social media networks just at John Campia. And don't forget, guys, you can follow Collider Video on Twitter as well, at Collider Video. Follow our Instagram, Collider Video is on Instagram as well. And for all your daily movie news stuff, best movie news site on the web, Collider.com. Go on over and make sure you check that out. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is John Campia for Collider Video. Until next time, bye-bye.